conversation. So I'm going to spend some time um, sharing my story and my experience, but really want to open up the conversation to the community about what we can do collectively to not just improve maternal health outcomes, but to put it into this crisis period full stop. So with that being said, um, I am Charles Johnson the fourth. I am a father. I am an advocate, dad to kid. Um, and but the best decision I ever made was making Kira Dixon, my wife Kira Johnson. So some of you all have heard me speak before know that I can brag about Kira all day long. I don't want to take up your entire afternoon, but just to talk about this woman who absolutely changed my life. We're talking about, when we talk about Kira, we're talking about a woman who raced cars, who had her pilot's license, who was an avid skydiver. Um, and so before I get into all of that, I want to just take a moment and share a brief video with you. Grace is going to help me cue it up and just introduce you all to Kira. What I would love to do is introduce Dr. Michelle Owens and Kelly Blinn. So very quickly, I'll just give you a little background on who these wonderful women are. Um, Dr. Michelle Owens is May's clinical director. She, I have to read her bio because it is, it is long, so bear with me. Not long, but I want to get it right. Um, she is the maternal fetal medicine subspecialist and the chief of the Maternal Fetal Medicine Division at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She's also a professor of, um, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and she also serves on the board of ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, among many other things. Um, and she's just an incredible woman, mother of three, um, and she's got a nine-year-old and two twins. So we are incredibly lucky to have her perspective, voice, and input here at May, and I am really looking forward to her facilitating this conversation with Kelly, who is an Ohio-based an Ohio -based doula and one of the very first members of May's provider network. She is a full-spectrum um, labor, delivery, postpartum doula. She's also a lac fetal lactation specialist and a, maternal, a mental health advocate and also a mom of two. Um, and she's just an incredible voice. She's contributed so much to May and she's also contributed to our blog. So please go check out her writing as well. It's, it's incredible. So with that, um, again, I'm gonna turn it over to those three. If you guys have questions, please put them in the chat comments, use your um, reactions to raise your hand and we'd love to just engage in a great conversation. Well, Rachel, thanks so much for um, the introduction. And Charles, it is always good to see you. Um, Thank you looking, so much. Um, hopefully the boys are are thriving and doing well. Um, and again, I just want to, to thank you for sharing that story. Every time you share it, I know um, a part of Kira stays alive, but I think a part of you probably really struggles. Um, and so I just appreciate your transparency and your honesty. Um, as it pertains to um, what truly is a, a tragic experience um, for you and for your family, but has has actually been a catalyst for so many wonderful things as it has helped to raise awareness in this space. Um, so just really quickly to, to jump off. Um, so you spoke a bit about your um, advocacy and one of the areas that um, we recognize that uh, many Black women struggle with is 
self-advocacy. Um, you know, your wife was, was lucky to have you at her side. There are many um, birthing people who don't have that level of support. Um, and so one of the things that we've been focusing on is trying to help raise awareness about self-advocacy, whether it's tools that people can use and how they can feel more comfortable advocating for themselves, but also um, the advocacy of your village and um, how we might utilize um, other individuals in order to be able to um, help advocate for for ourselves in the birthing process um, and whenever we engage with the healthcare uh, system. And, and doulas are one very important way that that can be done. Um, so if you could please just kind of share um, some thoughts or your thoughts about um, doulas. And I don't know if you've ever thought about, it. I think anytime something bad happens, people always think about, well, what other things could we have done? What might have made things different? I'm sure you replay that time and time again, but um, whether or not you feel like a doula might have been helpful for you and your situation and just kind of give uh, give our listening audience a little bit of background there. So absolutely. Um, let me just be as frank as I possibly can. Um, if there was one thing that I would have changed about uh, the choices we made with Curious Care, it would have been a doula, period. Period. I am a huge proponent of doulas. I am a huge supporter uh, and advocate of writing access to doulas, of diversification, of providing funding for doulas, of making sure that doulas not just get paid a living, but a thriving wage, right? Um, and so doula care is critically important. Um, I am of the belief that every mother in this country every birthing person, let me, let me widen this and be inclusive, in this country should have access to the dignified, respectful birth of their choice. And what that means to me is if they would like to give birth at home in their living room with their doula surrounded by their friends, and that is their choice. And not only should they have that right, but it should be paid for, right? If they wanna have, you know, that birth in a hospital with access to every modern day intervention, then that's their choice and it should be paid for. If they'd like to have an integrated care model where they have a doula and a midwife and an obstetrician, then they should have it and it should be paid for, right? Um, but let me just, we cannot underestimate the importance of the role of doulas. Um, and so with that being said, a lot of the legislation and the advocacy I've been working on is centered around um, bringing doulas and making them part of this. I want to be very clear about this, though. Here's one of the things I want to give some pushback, um, because we know that having doulas involved significantly um, improves outcomes, but doulas can't be charged to fix all of this, right? You can't put this on the, oh, throw some doulas at it. No, particularly when you've cast them out and had them on the, on the fringes for decades, you can't want to drag them in. So we have to reshape the, the entire system. We have to have care providers that um, are not intimidated or feel that doulas are undermining them. Um, people need to be informed about what their options truly are. Um, and yeah, but I am, I am a huge proponent of doulas. And so, um, there's, we're working, how we're doing that is we're working, we're doing it a couple of ways, Michelle, we're working with, um, with employers and healthcare plans to make sure that they are including doula care. Um, we are working on legislation to provide funding, uh, to provide doula care, to provide training, um, as an organization personally for Cure for Moms providing scholarships for doulas to be trained. Um, we have a wonderful working relationship with uh, Dona International, the National Association of Black Doulas, as well as Mama Glow. Um, so yeah, I, am, I'm, I, I hope to see um, doulas become more widely accessible um, and more included and prioritized in the birthing process. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that. So Kelly, I think that's a really great segue um, to kind of, we've, we've kind of talked about doulas, but there may be some people on the call who may not be familiar with the breadth and the scope of doulas. So if you could just kind of give a little bit of um, insight into um, what you do, we know that you're a full-fledged doula extraordinaire um, from beginning to end, but if you could just kind of let the people on the call know a little bit um, about what it is that you do and the kind of support that you provide, it may help to, I think, further substantiate what Charles started um, and kind of make some sense of why he is advocating so hard on behalf of the integration of doulas being seen as a full-fledged member of the healthcare team and to be able to increase access. Thank you. Uh, Charles, thank you so much. That's like the best review of doula care that any of us could get. And um, I speak for all doulas when I say I so much appreciate your encouragement, but also all the work that you're doing. We're all doing the work um, and that we appreciate it. Um, yeah, so um, Dr. Owens, thank you for hitting that, sending me that question. So the long and short of what I do is I am, um, as a labor doula, I am there from start to finish however long the birthing person wants me there. Um, so sometimes I meet up with them at home in early labor, or it's not until you are admitted into the hospital or if you're an induction patient, it's just kind of wherever uh, my client is ready for my support and I stay with them. So I'm a consistent face that has built a rapport with them over the course of their pregnancy. Uh, I, am, I personally am a very in-touch doula. So uh, we like to get together in person as many times as possible. Lots of calls and texts and emails Emails. I check in after every appointment, um, kind of let them voice any questions or concerns that might have come up throughout their prenatal visits. Uh, sometimes I attend those prenatal visits with them. And I am that familiar face that they have built a relationship with throughout the pregnancy. So uh, most of the time when you get admitted to a hospital, if you're giving um, birth at a hospital or a birthing center, um, it's some staff that you have not seen before. So in, in a hospital setting, it's that labor and delivery nurse who is an angel of a human, but you see them for about 12 hours or a 12 hour shift and you don't see them again and you probably had never met them before. So while you become friendly with that nurse, um, they're a stranger to you. If you are under the care of a larger physician practice, let's say many here in, in the city of Columbus, um, here in Ohio, you know, there's eight, 10, 12 physicians in a practice. And so you kind of get cycled through them throughout your prenatal visits and you don't really know who you're going to see when it's um, baby time. So a lot of times you just see that physician when you're pushing and they're there to, to catch the baby and assist and make sure everything's okay. So again, not only do you maybe have your support person, be it your spouse, partner, uh, best friend, whatever loved one, but I'm also there. Um, I offer encouragement. I offer suggestions. I often tell people that doulas are experts in options. So I'm going to give you options on how to get in a different position to get that baby where we need them to be. I'm going to give you options on, uh, you know what, your doctor said this, and they're coming back to, to get your decision in 10 minutes, but maybe we could reword it this way, or could you ask them this question? Um, so, you know, my support as a doula, quite frankly, is important. It is important, like, like um, Charles said, and um, I've heard, we all have heard too many stories similar to the Johnsons, right? Whether a, a doula was present or not, but people just not being listened to, not being taken seriously. We know that Black women's pain threshold is supposedly higher. That's what people say, right? So like Black women's uh, complaints of pain aren't taken as seriously as perhaps their white counterparts. I don't know who came up with that figure or how you can compute like one person's uh, pain tolerance to another compared to another. So correct, we pain the same. Um, so that that's the role of a doula, if you, if you didn't know what that looked like before, that's a snapshot. And I feel like that kind of lends, lends a question that I want to ask you, Charles, like um, for any fathers or any, you know, non-birthing people that are on this call or might, might be listening in, um, I'm curious how you would address them. Like, how can we help encourage them and not walk into a situation um, such as what you experience with trepidation and fear and, and also being combative? right? Like how can they be a great advocate to the birthing person um, if a doula isn't on the team? Or how can they, um, you know, like you did, you know, step forward for your wife, but 
you know, there, it was still, there was still so much that could have been done, right? And you just didn't even know. So I don't think I'm articulating that question very well. I hope you can understand what I'm trying to ask. Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll let you take over. Sure. So I, I think just to get the gist of what you're, what you're asking is like, how would I, what kind of recommendations would I do to, um, or suggest to support, support people, whoever is supporting that birthing person? Yeah. Um, and that's a great question. And so for me, um, I think that not just during the birthing experience, but even throughout the entire journey, it's important when possible. I understand that everybody has different family dynamics and I want to be sensitive to that. Um, but when there is a support person, whether that is a husband, whether that is a partner, whether that is a bestie, whether that is a parent, um, it's important that that support person is clear about the expectations of that um, of that expecting birthing person and what the standard of care that they expect to receive is. And that even starts with the manner in which um, they have somewhat difficult conversations and they shouldn't be difficult, but conversations with providers very early on. In the, in the event that you are in a place where you have the opportunity to meet with different providers, I understand that some people are in maternal care deserts and they don't have the luxury of that. But if say for instance, if you are in, in a relatively urban area and you have the opportunity to choose between the providers, I even start with the conversations that you have very early on. Questions like, Simply asking your provider, I'm going to, okay, I want to put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to, I'm going to, there's a second piece of this question about if they know about the Black maternal health crisis and what it is that they're doing as a practice or as an individual to make sure that if you are a Black woman, to make sure that you not only survive, but you thrive before, during, and after pregnancy, right? But I want to say this for everybody who is not African-American minority on this call. It's just as important for you to have that conversation. If you're a white woman and you go into your obstetrician's office, you need to ask the same question. It's important to have allyship. Did you know about the black maternal health crisis? What is it that we're doing as a practice to make sure that your black, that your black mothers survive and thrive, right? Um, that's one, and it's important to have those conversations. And I ask people to have those conversations because the manner in which that care provider responds is gonna tell you a lot. If they say, you know what? It is shameful what's happening, but this is what we're doing as a practice to make sure that you are protected and that you thrive. That's what you wanna hear. If that person gets defensive and that person tells you that I'm not racist, I treat all my patients the same, then that's probably a red flag, right? If they deny that it's happening, if they want to tell you that the data is incorrect, you need to find someplace else to go. <laughs> because what I tell people is, if this conversation offends you, then this conversation is for you, <laughs> right? And so it's important that we have those. It's important that we, to get more specific and more detailed, it's important that if there is a birthing plan that everybody is aware and on the same page about what the expectation is. It is important that people understand that what potential interventions could be and what the risk factors associated with those interventions are. It's important that everybody involved in, in the birthing process understands what informed consent is, right? And how that process should work. And I'll take it a step further. If you are giving birth at a hospital or a birthing center or wherever you're giving birth, it's important that you understand what that place's patient bill of rights is. Most hospitals, most birthing centers have that. And it's basically a, it's just that it is a set of criteria that informs what your rights are as a patient of that hospital. And oftentimes providers sweep those under the rug and will pressure you into things without, you know, understand what it, but if you, are, if you are informed about those things, performed about what potential interventions are, informed about what the potential risk factors are, but then also understanding pre and post birth warning signs is critically important. Understanding what to look out for. And then understanding how and what you, a, you should do to advocate for that loved one in the event that they are not able to advocate for themselves, right? And so that's why being in sync about what the expectation is, there was something that was shared on social media this morning. I didn't, I, I couldn't even comment because I had to process it. Some of you all may have seen it, but there was a letter that went out, I think from a New York hospital 
to patients and please, you know, put you saw it in the chat if you saw this, but there was a letter that went out from New York hospitals asking birthing people and mothers not to have birthing plans because it interferes with their job. They sent this letter out to every mother that is expecting at this hospital. Think about that. They are literally stripping autonomy from these people and telling them they don't need to have a preference. You need to do whatever we say do. That's problematic on a lot of levels, right? And and it, it's infuriating. Um, they're basically saying, you know, directly, you need to trust us and do what we say. We find we find that we find that birthing plans make the birthing process more difficult. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. Um, so I think those are the key things. I think being informed, being empowered about how you can, you know, that, that patient's bill of rights, understanding um, what and how you're able to escalate your concerns if, that, if it gets to that. But I think those are the key things that I would, I would suggest for people to be in, informed and empowered with. Charles Johnson, shame on you, because we are not going to be on this call for another hour and a half and you just opened up a whole like a whole separate zoom meeting for another day um with that and i feel like um so much that you said resonated um and and i will tell you too like in listening to your stories and when you're just sharing your thoughts you it it steps on on my toes as a physician because so much of what you say is really accurate um it is not reflective of the whole of medicine, but we have really been like the physician part. We've been part of that problem. And I feel like um, there needs to be ownership there. There needs to be introspection and there needs to be change um, because we can't have it both ways. You can't have a, a physician led team. And then if your team is consistently losing in one particular area, I mean, if it's if it's the NBA, if it's the NFL, if it's anything else, if it's any other team sport, you can't continue having a losing record without having a change somewhere, right? And typically, where's that change? The change is not usually getting rid of your star player. It's usually a change in leadership. And so from that standpoint, um, it is going to take us all. But if it's going to take us all, it takes us. Um, and so I, I, that really is something that is meaningful. Um, and I think that people need to hear that. Um, and and there needs to be physicians among us who are brave enough to to articulate that and to stand behind it and to kind of be the leaders of that change. Um, what I will say though is that there is, I wanted to kind of ask you this because it um, we we're talking about Black maternal health, sure. specifically on uh, leading up to Father's Day weekend and um, talking about. Um, black men and some of the issues that face us in in our own communities yeah i just want you to talk a little bit about your like specifically as a black male um did you find any particular challenges as it came to advocating for your wife whether before her birthing process or during were there any special considerations um are there i got Look, I got two little, I got two little brown boys that I'm raising in Mississippi. And so um, there are conversations that I have to have with them because I'm raising them in the United States, but I also have to give them their conversations that we have because of where we are. And so I just was wondering, you know, so you had you were in LA, you weren't in Hotlanta, you were in LA, yeah. you're in, you know, one of the places that's really supposed to be one of the, the premier medical centers in the area where you are that cater to um, a different socioeconomic group, um, very well known for being the place for the rich and famous. Um, did how was how was it as a black male navigating that process and what issues or concerns? Did you feel like that in any way hindered your ability to advocate or influence your abilities in any way? Yeah, um, I'll share with you all a story um, that's kind of painfully ironic. Uh, I've shared it, but I don't share it, I don't share it often. But so um, even the, this actually, this being aware innately, um, even began the night before, not having any idea what would plan out, what would 
play out. And I'll share this with you all. So the night before we went in for the delivery, um, we're getting ready for bed. And keep in mind, this is our, this is the second time around for us. So this is supposed to be a walk in the park, right? Dr. Owens, we, we've done all the over anxiety, all the over buying. We've done that. We're supposed to be pros, right? So I mean, we got our sweats and our flip flops um, packed and we're just ready to just, just, just have a nice little stay at the hospital and come home, right? Just comfort and function. That's what we're focused on. So we're getting ready to go to bed. Kira's in the mirror, and I remember this so crystal clear. Kira's in the mirror, um, brushing her hair, getting ready for bed. And she turns to me and she says, baby, I want to look really pretty for Langston tomorrow. And so she went in the closet. She picked out a dress, her jewelry, her earrings, everything that she was going to wear, right? I said, you know what? Let me get mine together because you never know when you need to look like you got a little bit of sense. And I went in there and I picked out a button up, some slacks and some loafers. And I left my sweats at home. But when it came down to it and when my wife was most vulnerable, none of that mattered. Because what they saw was a black man and a black woman um, and I think there were even points along this where they questioned whether or not I was her husband. Um, and, you know, like I think even when they came in and they asked me for my consent, they're like, well, you are, are you her husband? Why would you, would you ask, would you ask why about that? But here's what, here's what it comes down to. Not, let's, let's not talk about, let's not talk about how I feel. Let's talk about the facts. And this is painful for me to share too. When, K when Kira was at her most vulnerable, when she was in tremendous pain, when she was losing blood, when her vital signs were dropping, you know what Kira kept on saying to me? Baby, stay calm. Baby, please stay calm. Because Kira knew, even in her state, that if I lost my temper, if I raised my voice, if I slammed my fist on the nurse's station, then as a black man, I would not see, be seen as a loving father that was concerned for his wife. I would be seen as a threat and I would potentially be re removed or arrested from the situation. So in Kira's most vulnerable state, she was worried about me, right? And so we have to have these conversations about the lived experiences of black people and the manner in which we have to fight and struggle and sometimes suppress our instincts throughout this conversation. Now, Jones to pose that to this. And so for me, as I, as I relive this every single day of my life, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what I should have, would have, could have done differently. Should I have, and I'm not, I'm not a meek person, right? So I was being assertive as I can, as being as direct. I feel like I'm an effective communicator, right? But should I have been louder? Should I have screamed? Should I have grabbed a, a doctor by their by their coat? Said, do something now. Should I have, you know, slammed monitors? What should I? What could I have done more? But the reality of the situation, there's nothing that I can think about that doesn't result in me being arrested or removed from the situation. And the only outcome that I can think of, Dr. Owens, this worse than what happened to Kira would have been had I lost my composure been removed and then Kira passed away. There is no way I would be in a padded room someplace, right? But when my wife was most vulnerable, I was forced to suppress my anger so that I would not be seen as a threat. And it's so hurtful that at, at her, at her, in her final hours, that was her concern. She was concerned. She knew, and she also knew that the family was looking to me as the patriarch. So they knew if I went off, everybody's going off. Her brother who's, you know, six foot five is going off, right? Her aunt, everybody is going off. And let me juxtapose that and share this. And we've had these conversations. We've, we've had these conversations for years privately, but he's, you know, been more adamant about sharing them publicly now. So a lot of you are familiar with Alexis O'Hannon, who's Serena's husband and, and the situation that happened with Serena. Um, what Alexis had, and I'm very proud of him for sharing this. And we've, we've, you know, we've gotten to know each other over the past couple of years. And he's beginning to share his experience um, as Serena was the chair. And, and Alexis said is that this, he said that his experience, people think that the story that's been told is that Serena had to beg and advocate to get this CT scan to get done. 
the real story of what happened was Alexis, those of you all who aren't familiar, who is Alexis, is a multi-billionaire. The reason that Serena got the help that she needed is that Alexis went out in the hall and told them that he would spend every dime he had burning the hospital to the ground if they didn't help his wife. So it was Alexis's privilege, even though his wife is literally superhuman, it was Alexis's privilege as a white man that saved his wife. And I appreciate Alexis's um, ability and his allyship to express that. He said that there's never been a more blatant illustration. He said, he said Charles, I'm, I'm a billionaire. He said, I'm used to getting what I want. I thought I understood my privilege. There was no other time and more greater example of my privilege than that moment, right? Um, and so you have to look at that. You have to look at that and we cannot understate. And that's why it's so important to not just have bundles, to not just do this, but to overall over here, overhaul the system and prioritize dignified care. And dignified care means the respect and prioritization of the people who are there to advocate and support that birthing person. Wow, that is just just really powerful. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, Tony Gillespie, I see that you uh, threw a comment in the chat that kind of uh, touched on uh, Charles's original conversation that has spurred yet another Zoom call for another day on um, people trying to suppress um, individual choice in their birthing process. I kind of don't understand how if you are going to choose to birth in a hospital, how someone would want to remove that from you. But then again, I recognize I also don't represent everything and change has to come. Um, but thank you for using that. And I just want to remind the rest of our participants that if you have a question, you can definitely feel free to use the raise your hand um, option and we will take your questions or you can drop them in the chat and we'd be happy to ask them on your behalf. Um, this yeah, was- Tony, I just, I just saw Tony's, I just saw Tony's comment. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it's a lot. Um, can we can we share, can I can I can I can I share that for people that might Absolutely. not have seen it? So Tony, Tony shared that just last week um on our MCH uh ECHO basically learned that hospital that he learned that a hospital that serves black and brown families require all patients that come to their OB clinic to have a mandated schedule induction at 40 weeks. That is nuts. That's nuts. That's nuts, and that's unfortunate. Okay, we have some hands up. So I'll, 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 I'll uh, Dr. Williams, I'll let you kind of go and kind of uh, see. Okay. Who has, I, I think. All right. So um, I think yeah, Isaiah has a hand up. up here. Isaiah, yeah, I can see him. Go okay. ahead, Isaiah. Go ahead with your question. Um, well, I'm mute and go ahead. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, Charles, I first found out about you through, well, I, your mother, Judge Hatchet. Like I found out through you, through her show, and I. I mean, I, I love your mother's show. I, I watch as many episodes as I can. So I kind of want to know, well, I think I have a few questions. I hope you don't mind. Uh, first one, what was it like sure. gr growing up with her? Because she was she seems like to be a very tough woman. <laughs> yeah, so first question is, Isaiah, um, I'm glad that you watched the show. I can't do it. Um, it gives me PTSD. Um, oh. When people go in there and, and I'm, I'm joking. But it's funny because <laughs> I watch it. It's funny, like when I when people go in there and they might mouth off or they might say something. It, I like, oh, it gets me. I like, oh, and I just start to change the channel. Like, oh, they're about to get it. Um, but no, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Um, you know, she's still, you know, I'm I'm extremely proud of my mom. I'm, um, you know, I'm just so proud of what she's done. But um, anybody that knows my mom, but to me, it's, it's she's she's just mom, right? Um, and. Anybody that knows her knows that she is the anti-diva. She is just, um, you know, she still is the exact same person from Southwest Atlanta. Um, and so it's just really interesting that, um, you know, it would just kind of be this weird shock when we would go places or do things with her and people would gravitate or just, you know, just swarm her and stuff. But it was, it's, it's cool. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of her. Mm, that's good. Um, second question: um, Because you you're a great speaker and everything, how many like places do you visit at least a year or something like that? Oh man, I wish I knew. I know that um, Eva is on here, who is you know who runs operations for me, and she could probably tell you. Um, mm -hmm. It's been interesting. 
I, I will tell you this, that there was a time uh, in around 2000, 2000, 2019, 2020, right before the pandemic, that there would be weeks that I would be in four or five different cities in the same week. Mm-hmm. Um, when we really began to, you know, in my mind, but I, 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 I count every single opportunity to share a curious story and do this work as a tremendous blessing. Um, and somebody said something to me um, the other day, and they were like, "Well, how do you keep? How do you keep doing this? Um, and you know, when is enough enough?" And I, we had this was kind of shortly after we. Um, for those of y'all who don't know, we just we did something that was pretty monumental uh, about a month ago. Um, there is a there's been a wrongful death action against Cedar Sinai, but one of the things that happened. Um, in the process of discovery for Cure's wrongful death case is we learned so much. We had whistleblowers from Cedars come out and some speak specifically about what I knew was the impact of race on Cure's situation. So we've filed what I hope will be a landmark uh, civil rights lawsuit against Cedar sinai um, for the manner in which they basically discriminated against Kira and not providing the care that she deserved because she was like, so it's now I have to say, um, somebody was asking me about this and and I was in my response was I was that I don't take any of this for granted because I'm not that far removed from a time when nobody was listening. Hmm. I'm not that far removed. I remember vividly how hard it was to get people to pay attention to listen um, when I first started sharing your story. So every time I get the opportunity, um, even if it's like it is now, it's in the middle of my bed vacation, I'm going to make it happen because every single conversation, every single relationship, every single awakening um, is critical because people ask what they what they do. It can be as as, as significant as, as getting involved in the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, as going like Kelly and becoming a doula, but it can be as simple as simply having a conversation, right? And asking the people in their circle if they are aware about it this mm. and you know making sure that the people around them are informed or empowered so the more conversations we have the more dialogue we have um all of that is part of chipping away at um at the issue mm. charles charles can i jump in and ask you to kind of based on some of the things you were just saying about just kind of like having that conversation and talking um yeah. i think you know so much of what we focus on a lot of times is the birthing experience and creating community for that woman or that that birthing person. But obviously in a moment like this, you need your own village, you need to kind yeah. of create. So can you speak to a little bit about how you found your village of support as a non-birthing person, as a, as a supporter of your birthing partner? Sure, sure. And you mean after, after you know, post, after the- Yeah, birth. yeah. Just- yeah, so, you know, I think the first thing for me is I'm fortunate um, that, I had um, community and support from my, I have a wonderful family and extended family that rallied around my boys in tremendous ways. Um, But what I found out, Rachel, really quickly is there were things and there were ways, there were just things that they were just, that they couldn't relate to. And so um, I kind of, built the community that I needed. And, and unfortunately, and it was kind of organic. Um, but as I began to do this work, Rachel, I began to, as, as Cure Story began to um, be more widely recognized with the, one of the byproducts was that people began to reach out um, who had had similar birthing experiences. And then it became like a Every time a woman would pass away, I would just make it, you know, my mission to track down that family and reach out to that husband or partner or family. And so it is one of the things that is hardest for me. And I hate adding people to this group and this, you know, very reluctant fraternity, but I've kind of built this community of people with similar experiences of men and families from all over the country that have gone through it and we do our best to support each other um, because we can relate to each other in ways that other family members can, other loved ones, even therapists can, right? Um, understanding 
what the unique challenges of raising these children in the absence of these angels, of trying to um, navigate financial things, of trying to celebrate, of trying to deal with birthdays and anniversaries, all those things and things. We just try and do our best. And sometimes we talk trash, sometimes we talk sports, sometimes, and sometimes we have very, you know, real conversations, but we also just try and support each other. So, you know, when um, people, I don't want to say just brothers, and I say brothers without regards to, you know, race or creed, um, you know, have something going on that they're trying to do. Um, you know, I fly out for birthday parties. I fly out, um, you know, for anniversaries. Um, I fly out for, you know, and I, we just try and support each other. And so that's kind of the other part of that is just trying to, um, like I said, we have this very reluctant community of people that are in the same boat, but um, we're working together to heal and we're working together for change. That's awesome. Um, Kelly, I think, um, did you, were you going to go ahead and ask? Okay. Yeah, I have a question that just kind of evolved out of what you just shared, Charles. So sure. um, as, as Rachel included in my brief intro, like I'm a, a mental health advocate. I worked in maternal mental health for a few years here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but also, you know, so I'm a mental health advocate for, for men, women, black, brown, green, blue, or whatever, you know, and yeah. What I would love to see happen someday, um, when I'm, maybe when I'm old and gray, is, a, is, is um, mental health support specific for the male partners, whether they be spouse, husband, boyfriend, whatever. And I'm just kind of curious in your process, um, what you came across throughout maybe any kind of your research on like, is there, is there a group for me? Is there somebody out there talking about these things? And if there wasn't, like what became the thing that pushed you over the edge and you were like, okay, not only am I gonna take this heartbreak and turn it into a passion and move it forward, but like enough is enough. Does that make sense? Like yeah. there's a lot of resources um, throughout the nation for women or for the birthing person and, and it's phenomenal and we always need to add more, but I would love to be able to have that specific to male partners, husbands, fathers, because we process things differently. Many of us do. Yeah. Or if somebody were to encounter a group that is already established but doesn't feel like it fits their need, um, I'm kind of curious where you fall into that in the, the past few years and what you might, um, might what you might have to suggest to us who want to make something for the future. Yeah, so um, you know I, I I couldn't agree with you more, Kelly. I think that um, the mental health component of this crisis and um, dealing with trauma is inflicted by, you know, uh, you know, the obstetrical experience in the United States across the board is critically important. Um, with specificity, when we talk about men, I think the first step is really getting beyond the stigma associated with mental health, right? Um, I think that we've made tremendous strides as a society, even more importantly, we made, we're making strides as an African-American community and African-American male community about the um, acceptance and the stigma associated with mental health and mental health issues and it being okay to seek help. Um, with that being said, um, there are several different grief support groups um, and our kind of group works in an informal fashion. But what we've done as an organization with specificity, Kelly, is we've created what we call the maternal mortality response team. And the way that this works is I kind of reverse engineered this um, out of what are the things that I wish I had on April 13th of 2016. And so the idea with this is that whenever there is a woman that passes away anywhere in the country from childbirth or childbirth related complications, for Cure for Moms, which is the foundation we started in Cure's honor, we'll be able to mobilize a team to support that family within 72 hours, right? And that changed a little bit during the pandemic, but mobilize a team to support that family within 72 hours. What does that support look like? It looks like practical things. So all the baby care supplies, formula before the shortage, um, diapers, practical things. We don't want that wipes. We don't want that family to have to pay for any of those things for the first year. Right. We have partners that are coming to the table to support um, KPMG and Huggies. Um, we that looks very importantly, Kelly, like 
the mental support services, making sure that they have the counseling and, and uh, support that they need to heal. Not only the immediate family, but extended family. So we're working to provide those services, right? Um, that looks like childcare. Um, as I said, I'm very fortunate to have a tremendous family, an extended family that rallied around my family. Um, but many, you know, what happens if you are a single father who's an hourly worker, like some of my friends, um, who is now responsible for the life of this precious child and has to make the choice between work and putting food on the table? What happens if you are a grandparent who has trouble making it up the steps in your house by yourself? and now is responsible for the life of this precious baby, right? Being able to support those families and, and tailor that support to whatever it is that they need. Um, it looks like legal support. I can tell you story after story, Kelly, about families being pressured to sign documents, about medical records being destroyed, about language barriers being exploited, immigration status is being exploited and threatened um, in a manner to get people to sign away their, their rights or under duress. It's crazy. Um, and so when it calls for it, we provide, you know, free legal services to help families navigate this. So um, saying all that to say, the, but going back to the mental health aspect, um, we are continuing to expand that and broaden it and try and shape things that are even more effective for men. Because I think here's another thing that's important, right? Is not only the impact of a traumatic, I'm sorry, uh, a maternal loss, but even a traumatic birthing experience or a near miss experience can have tremendous ripples in the pond for partners, right? And more importantly for, for mothers, and you know, I come across families all the time. And sometimes I even have, you know, oftentimes we think about how obstetric violence near misses um, alters family planning, right? So you have women um, that may have wanted four kids and they nearly stay, and they had a horrific birth experience. They're saying, oh my gosh, I only, that's it for me. I want my tubes tied. I want nothing to do that. And that's heartbreaking. But also I come in contact with fathers all the time that are like, look, I almost lost her. We're not doing that again. And the, and, and, and the wife might be like, or the partner might be like, I want more babies. And he's like, nope, mm -mm, you're not going to leave me here with these kids by myself, right? And, it, and it's real. And so it's not only the losses, but the traumatic birthing experiences that have to be examined and explored and, you know, helpfully finding ways, continuing to find ways to support people as they heal from those traumas. Thank you. So I've, sure. I've now got us officially down, Charles, we're officially down to three future Zooms because birth is a traumatic experience is another whole separate one as well. I, you just keep adding, the list is getting long. I hope you got some free time in the next couple of years. We'll make it happen. We'll make it happen. But, no, but I just, I'm not sure because in this work, you may, you may look at numbers and reports and feel like, things are going in the wrong direction. Um, but I, I wanted to just take a moment again to thank you and to say, I don't know if you recognize how much of an impact you've made um, you so and much. how meaningful that is. I'm telling you, cause look, cause we chit chat with each other too, as, as friends among friends, like in our physician circles. And one of my dear friends said to me, when I was telling them about this, this um, meeting and they said, oh yeah, I heard about that story. And they were like, I think of her every time I'm oh, wow. Charles, listen to me. Wow. Said, I think of her mm. every time I go in the OR to do a section. And especially when it's the routine repeats, when it's something that I think is just an easy chip shot and I'll be... Ooh an easy out I think of her and I I hover a little longer I spend mm. a little more time I'm a I, I'm a, a little more cautious because wow. of her and I just wanted to tell you that because wow. because the the change is not going to happen fast enough um for this thing to be over uh, we're going to have to fight the fight for a long time because it took us a long time to get here and recognize it. So it's not going to happen fast enough, but I just want you to be encouraged and to know that 
Um, that means so have, much. That means we so much. Know what role models um, little boys need growing up. And I think there's uh-huh. nothing better for a young man who's growing up in this country, especially a little black boy, to see a, a, a man who has embraced his enthusiasm as a father who could stand up and say the wonderful things like you say about your wife, um, mm-hmm. but to also honor their mother's legacy and memory in the way that you have. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. You're, you're an amazing human being, man. You're uh, thank you so and much. we're so grateful to you for spending this time with us. And so um a couple of things. Tony's dropped some really nice links in the um in the chat as well as Kelly um one on uh, mental health and postpartum. I think and Tony's talking about the work that they're doing in Indiana. I got some good friends in Indiana um that are doing some great public health work and that are working awesome. in space. And so just wanted to let people know that that's in the chat. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Rachel. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Charles, thank you. Dr. Owens, Kelly, thank you. I think um, it was just an incredibly moving and powerful conversation, and I'm so honored to have had the space to be part of it today. So thank you for being here. Thank you all for joining us. Um, And Charles, I think from the whole May family, we wish you a really happy Father's Day.